Today it's finally time to dip our toes into some optimized Generation 3 content, so grab yourself a Sodi Pop and let's see how Rayquaza does in Pokemon Emerald. Now this video, it's been months and months in the making, and a lot of that is just because I recently have became a father, I've had a baby. But just in general, the act of learning a new game at a decent level alone and making sure it's up to my idea of quality, that's also a huge reason. So I went back and forth, how am I going to do this video, and I kept kind of penciling down what I'm going to say and what I'm going to explain. I don't want to over explain things so I just want to keep the intro short here now if you're here you're new or maybe you're just wondering if a new game means new rules the simple answer is that it does not things are virtually the same with the sole exception that Emerald does have a few double battles sprinkled in now there are also going to be some quality of life changes and some ROM changes that I've implemented but they are very similar to how I would do things in other videos instant text early encounters guaranteed HM users modified spinners those are things that I consider pretty mandatory to keep a solid one-to-one -one comparison when you're ranking Pokemon and I really wanted to get rid of some of the tedium but I'm not going to go into too much detail here all the rules all these ROM changes they can be found in the description you can always ask me about it below now really the only thing I would like to address here is DMA it means that memory addresses will just kind of jump around move around a little bit now a minor side effect is that my overlay will look occasionally flicker whether it be my stats or maybe like a badge popping in and out and the bigger side effect is that I cannot use code to set my IVs like I normally do so I have to use PK hex for my IVs and my nature this means that I will be starting every emerald run in front of the professor right after you get your Pokemon it'll be at exactly two minutes of in-game time and I think that kind of catches us up I think we can finally just kind of jump into the action <laughs> First things first, I have completely redesigned the overlay from the ground up. I didn't want to just keep adding in things to the same overlay that I'm always using and just like, it's already cluttered. I didn't want to make it even more cluttered. The idea here is I wanted something to be really clean, really easy to digest, and just to get the point across. But I always want the main focus to be, you know, the crazy thought here, the game that we're actually playing. So I want the game to be the main focus, but you can see the similarities with the other overlay. Let me know what you think. I'd really like some feedback on this, but I really like the way things turned out. I did have to sacrifice putting the the learn set on the screen it, it just couldn't fit so quickly we'll jump into that go over some stats now Rayquaza is a box art legendary you already know the stats are gonna be great but the standouts here are gonna be that 150 in attack and special attack and when we look over at the level up moves there's honestly there's not a whole lot that's really good the start is actually pretty weak and the really the only decent part to me is the level 20 and the level 30 moves with Dragon Claw and Dragon Dance these moves will be very helpful they'll go a long way in the playthrough and we're never going to reach a high enough level to use the last few moves and i'm not going to show the tm and hm list today because there's just there's simply too much ray learns too many moves and if i were to put the list up here he would learn everything now what you need to know is that if it's a pretty good tm or hm ray quasa learns it the ability today is going to be airlock which is going to negate all weather effects and for the nature today i went with quiet it seems like a pretty clear choice. Now, this is going to increase my special attack, which is going to come in clutch to push a few ranges during the run, and it's going to lower my speed, which is 10% off of speed doesn't mean anything to Rayquaza. He has more than enough to be just fine without it, and I will say that going forward, I think a minus speed nature is going to be the clear-cut choice for most really good Pokemon. Now, with all that set up, I need you guys to know that Rayquaza is not perfect, especially early. Now, just like in Gen 1, we have a rock solid solid challenge with Roxanne coming up, but unlike Brock, there's going to be actual rock moves. That's crazy. So you couple that with a much improved AI and I will need some levels and it all starts really early in the game after the first mandatory trainer. I'm going to be fighting Bug Catcher Rick and then I'm going to move over to Last Tiana. And then when we get done with that, going into Petalburg, it is of the utmost importance to at least enter the Poke Center here. Now here in this specific run, I do have to heal. I'll go into why it's so important to come in here later, but it's worth pointing out that my routing is going to be based off of Wave Warriors world record speed run and we'll talk about that more come back to it soon another really cool thing about emerald that i really like is that repels are just you can buy them decently early i really 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 like this change because it shows that game freak kind of understood that maybe going through several early routes maybe going through a cave like mount moon or going through a forest and just being bombarded with unfun random wild encounters just isn't great for anybody and having the option to use repels early just gives the player a good choice i love it 
Moving forward to Petalburg Woods. There's only one optional battle here. It's Bug Catcher James. I'm gonna take him out. Notice I do pick up the ether after. We'll come back to that. And then when we get to Route 104, there's one more optional trainer here. It's Last Haley. And moving up, there's a very, very important spot that has a lot of pretty crucial berries, I would say. Now, I picked up Orin berries already up to this point. They are just your standard 10 HP healing held items. But this spot right here, like I just said, very important. You'll get some near mandatory items for a playthrough. Cherry berries will cure paralysis. Really great for something like Watson. Then you get Lepa berries, which are essentially ethers. They restore HP, and they are really important to this wave warrior top route that I'm gonna go into. And then the old lady, if you talk to her, you'll get a Chesto berry. Pretty good for Norman. Now this right here, already early in the game I think this is one of the most important spots in the run but let's keep going now entering Rustboro I do forget to grab cut right here cuts right next to the mark normally if you're playing a game and you skipped an HM it could be run ending you'd just start over but in Emerald you really don't you don't need cut at all and in this specific run and this route I don't even need to use it to about the fifth gym area so it's there's a very convenient spot in the run where you'll be running right back through Rustboro anyway so I keep going on now level Level 9, it's nowhere close to being able to take on Roxanne, so I'm going to head up. I'm going to train on Route 116, and here I need to talk about Abra. I've mentioned that Wave Warrior world record speed run a lot. And I think that the linchpin of that run is the Abra Manip. Now, the ability to get Abra and teleport, it almost makes it a different game than just base Emerald. It's it's a very weird. We'll see it play out. I'll explain it a little bit. I would say that the old route in comparison feels very, very clunky, but that's beside the point. Now, the main thing is that teleport is going to open up a lot of fun little time saves that I'll cover. But in general, looking at Route 116, there's six total trainers here that I'll be taking on. Nothing really overly interesting outside of the third trainer school kid Karen she will usually always paralyze you and it's very annoying but the focus of this route and the setup with Abra is that you cannot enter or heal at the Rust Burrow Poke Center now you might have seen this earlier I might have already shown it on the screen but you'll notice that I'm using Lepa berries and that's very important because I need to keep my twister PP up high and think about it this way I have 20 power points of twister there's two Lepa berries there's an ether in uh, Petalberg woods that gives me a a total of 50 power points of twister and I need to use that without healing once in Rustboro and I would say that the Abra route overall it's kind of like a smart resource management route and using like very strategic choices of where you need to save time and those Lepa berries I cannot state how important they are back in Rustboro I'm gonna fight the three trainers available and after I finish that last hiker I'm gonna hit level 13 and finally it's time to talk about Roxanne there's a couple of things that went into preparation here now number one is that the quiet nature and level 13 it gives me about a 56 percent chance to one shot the geodudes so more or less just a coin flip i do get the one shot on the first one but the second one's going to survive and it's going to get off the dreaded rock tomb super effective damage and lower my speed now it's going to get a potion eventually i'm going to take it out and let's move on to the nose pass now this is where we're going to start to see some of the more interesting quirks of gen 3 ai nose pass is going to miss a rock tomb it's going to connect with the second now at this point i have minus two speed i'm at 14 speed that's going to put me lower than the nose passes speed now speed control i don't i'm not a master of gen 3 ai just yet but speed control is a very weird thing that'll make the ai act a little bit weird but now that i'm lower speed than nose pass notice that it's going to, it's going to go for moves like block It'll go for tackle, and instead of just going for rock tomb and just winning the battle, it's basically just gonna give me the win here, and that's how it's gonna end. But speed control, moves like rock tomb, very interesting to watch in action. Now, this isn't a great fight, but we do come away with the victory. After that, there's some busy work. No need to really go into it. You're gonna go rescue Pico. Then you go talk to the Devon president. And after that is when you're gonna see your first little Abra teleport time skip. It's the first of many. This will take us back to Petalburg and give us a faster route when we're going to go take the boat. 
But first, we get our first HM user of the run. I'm not gonna, like, think of this first video as me just kind of talking through a lot more junk than I need to talk about. So we'll talk about the first HM user. I'm gonna pick up Meryl. I think Meryl's the standout star. It can learn tons of things. We're gonna pick it up. And that's gonna take us directly into a boat ride, a swift boat ride, not a swim. We get the upgraded treatment here in Gen 3, down to Duford. And down here, not really much going on. I will say that when you're delivering the letter to Steven I really like that flash is just given to you like the first little hiker you see just gives you flash now in gen 1 flash is so far out of the way you would just never do it and then when you get to gen 2 you have to go through the entirety of sprout tower so another thing where you can skip it but I really like that it's just available just to talk to a guy on the straight line mandatory path so unlike Gen 1 and Gen 2, I'll just be using Flash for my runs rather than learning how to navigate the dark and then eventually modding out the dark. So that's pretty cool. This is a pretty short segment. You literally just talk to Steven and then I'm immediately just going to go into the gym and now we can talk about Brawly. And this is a very simple, straightforward fight. I am a part flying type, so I resist fighting. And I just have a great matchup here, and the battle's not going to look like much. But I will say that in the future, Brawly is one of the harder gems. Even when you look at the official like high tier speed runs, they will just skip this gem altogether and come back to it later. So Brawly's not something you're always going to be able to make trivial just like this. But just for the purposes of today's video, Rayquaza, great matchup. We make this one look easy. We already got our second badge, so things are looking pretty good. So I'm actually going to skip past Slateport. That's where you go next, but there's really nothing interesting happening there. And instead, let's go to the next route where there's these two Pokey fans. They have Plusle and Minin, and they exist for one reason. Let me tell you guys, I think these are some of the worst trainers in the entire run. They exist only to paralyze you. Both of them can do it. They're going to eat up. There's a paralyzed heal that you can get in Petalburg Woods. Usually School Kid Karen eats that up. You can pick up four cherry berries on the way to Rustboro, which I did. And this fight generally eats up two of them. So this is very annoying. It's not going to look very annoying here, but just trust me, this just slows down your run a lot. And I really hate these two trainers a lot. There's two of them. Now, immediately after that, there's going to be the trick house right here. I'm actually going to pause the footage, point an arrow to it just so we can talk about it. Now, this is where you will get the very first rare candy of the game if you want to, but you have to have cut. Now, remember, I didn't pick up cut earlier, but it's no big deal because even if I had an HM user and I wanted to use cut, I just simply wouldn't do it. I don't know if this is the right time in the video because we haven't even picked up a single rare candy yet, but rare candies are a little bit slow to ramp up in Emerald, but there's 16 total that you can pick up, uh, 17 if you count the post game. So there's a ton of rare candies. And in fact, we're not even gonna pick up like seven or eight of them. In my opinion, going through a bunch of tests of this game, this is the absolute slowest and worst rare candy to get out of almost all of them. You have to go through so many hoops, hurdles, optional battles, all that kind of stuff just to get to this rare candy and it's just simply not worth it and I really wanted to highlight it because it's kind of a shame because I think a lot of runs are going to have problems with Watson and they're going to have to do the trick room to get the rare candy and it's kind of sad because it's such a long slog to get to it and I'm sorry if you're a trick room fan, it's just not very efficient, not a very good rare candy to get. Now this route is pretty interesting, we don't have to go into the rival, probably never for Rayquaza Great matchup, you already know. We can just skip past it. There's gonna be a couple of optional battles here. Nothing really too interesting going on. I, I at least wanna tell you guys where I'm picking up optional battles, but that can just take us up to Mauville. Now you can pick up Rock Smash, you can get the bike. Let's talk about the bike for a second because I don't think it's very useful. Getting the Acro bike will give you access to more candies later and it's a little bit easier to control. I don't know if any of you guys have ever tried to use the mock bike on times three or times four speed, but it's intense. I would not recommend it. Now something I have not talked about, this is what it's going to segue me into is the running shoes. You can just hold down B to move faster. And when you're on faster speeds like I play on, I find that just using the running shoes is you can just control it so well and you can just like stop on a dime, use it on and off way quicker than you can the bike. And I find myself using the running shoes far more than I would ever use the bike. I probably should have mentioned those at the very start of the game when you get them from your mom. But the bike is helpful. Can't deny that. But it's the running shoes to me that were the real MVP. So I've already mentioned Watson just a little bit. He's pretty tough. 
Level 20 is not a great level to fight him at that I found anyway. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go train. It's gonna be the route east of here. You're gonna have to go here eventually anyway. You're gonna have to fight at least a couple of these trainers no matter what. They give pretty good experience yields. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and take out the trainers over here, get me a little bit of experience. And then eventually I'm gonna make my way into the gym where I'm gonna fight only two trainers. It's gonna put me at level 22, probably about 80% of the way to level 23. And that's exactly where I want to be very calculated when we're taking a look at Watson. Now this is probably what most people would consider, myself included, one of the hardest fights in the game, one of the biggest roadblocks for lots of runs. So I have my cherry berry around my neck to get rid of paralysis once, and the one side effect of only being level 22 trying to save some time here is that I do not outspeed the Voltorb. This is like one of maybe two occasions where the minus speed nature comes into play, but it's just Voltorb. It really doesn't matter. I can one shot him and we can move on. Now I will hit level 23 directly after this. Level 23 is a very, very important level. In the short term, it means that I can easily just one shot a Electric with Dragon Claw that we learned at level 20. And now for the strategy and what what made this fight I would say almost 100% consistent and it revolves around manipulating health levels what do I mean by that so with Magneton here he's gonna use Thunder Wave we're gonna be able to heal it once so what we want to do is take his health down with Twister why Twister you have Dragon Claw well Twister does just enough damage my friends just enough damage so that when I use Dragon Claw on the following turn he is not in a range where he'll use a potion so he will not heal up to full which is very important that means that the second dragon claw will take it out and I can avoid any stalling shenanigans with potions and then when we look at the end to the manetric the same exact thing applies chip it down with twister the AI will not use a potion and a dragon claw can finish it off now it looks very simple on paper and it is and I got really lucky in this one for some reason Watson didn't go for an immediate thunder wave so you can see that by the time I'm on the manetric I'm not even paralyzed so pretty fortunate but even if I was paralyzed this fight was really consistent and it's all thanks to twister and manipulating HP ranges so that you don't see a bunch of potions and if you start to get stalled out while you're paralyzed things go bad pretty quick but I'm pretty happy to get this one down and now my friends there's gonna be a lot of busy work that we got to take care of And to me, this is one of the, the points of the game where I feel like it's a little bit of a slog. I don't mind it. I don't hate it. It's not as bad as like Gen 2 rocket sections or anything like that. But I'm essentially going to make a gigantic loop multiple times during this section of the game. It is the slowest part to me, but you're going to take this loop. And I do have to talk about a couple of trainers I'm going to fight. We don't have to show them just like every other optional trainer. But there's two cool trainers leading up to the little soot cover place before fall. Arbor. They're very important, very efficient, really good trainers. And then in Fall Arbor Town is where I'm going to buy my escape ropes. I'm going to buy my super repels for the rest of the run. Moving ahead, there's going to be two more optional trainers. There's three total trainers. One of them you have to fight. There's two more trainers. This is all for a very, very important reason. Now, since I haven't played a thousand emerald runs yet, I will tell you that I think that the mid game where you're looking at like the second, third, fourth gym, a lot of Pokemon are going to struggle. That's why we're doing some extra training here today. But just like always, you got to trust in the process. And I will say that in Meteor Falls, I do enjoy the fact that this is where you kind of first really meet the kind of higher ups in Team Magma and Team Aqua. And there's a scientist sitting there and the game, you know, highly expects you to talk to the scientist to kind of understand. But since you're doing like a speed run here, you just kind of run past them. You don't even acknowledge them. And I kind of like that a lot. Now, this part is where you're going to loop back down and you're going to go back to Route 116, which if you don't remember, that's where we picked up Abra right above Roxanne. So this is where you can go pick up Cut. That's what I'm going to do. Now, this is where you're going to use Rock Smash. You're going to pick up Strength. And I touched on this in an old video. Tell me what you guys think about this. This couple separated and you reunite them. And she's like, oh, uh, why don't you come back to my place to get some rest? Guys, we know they're not going to take a rest. Comment what they're going to go do down below. Wrong answers only. But this part right here is going to be yet another. I think it's the second 
Abra teleport skip. Rather than go down and fight the trainer, I'm going to use the escape rope to go out. And then we're going to use our anchor point in Mauville. Mauville is an all important anchor point. We're going to go back there several times through teleport, but this just saves a little bit of time. And what makes this part frustrating? I talked about this being the biggest slog of the run. I probably shouldn't say frustrating, but now I'm going to go redo the exact same route that I just did just so that I can go and mess around with Team Magma for a little bit. Not really any interesting battles. They're not as bad as like Gen 1, Gen 2 rockets where they're severely under leveled. They at least kind of keep up with your level here. I don't have any complaints about the team battles or anything like that. More or less just the circular route that you have to do twice right here. When you do get done with this little Team Magma segment, you can pick up the Meteorite. It's worth mentioning that you can trade the Meteorite for Return a little bit earlier than you normally would be able to. I don't need it here. We're not going to use Return. But there's several things that I'm not going to show off, not really going to talk about that you could do in other runs, such as Secret Power, maybe the Silk Scarf, things of that nature that we don't really need to talk about. But what's very important, what I need you guys to do right here, always buy a lava cookie from old grandma here. Lava cookies are pretty cheap. They're essentially just a full heal, but never leave the jagged pass without a lava cookie. That's my words of wisdom for you. Directly after that, you're going to make it to Lava Ridge Town. Now, I'll leave it up to you guys to like what could what guess could you fathom what kind of gym lava ridge town would have I, you know it's a mystery we may never know but i will say before we get into the battle that i do quite like the gyms in gen 3 you know gen 1 and gen 2 they started toying with the ideas of having little themes in the gym whether it be like you know blaine's puzzles tombstone or brother you already know about all that kind of stuff and then you got like morty in gen 2 with his little invisible walkways but things like this are like the clear evolution when you look at flannery's gym right here knowing which little hole to jump in and out of or maybe like winona's gym with the little wood puzzles and stuff like that i just really like the design of the gym i really like the the gen 3 gym leaders but let's not gush too much let's just dive into that gym and this is just another gym where there's nothing really special going on here. Just in general, the dragon topping, unless you're running into like a steel top or something of that nature, it's just, it's really strong. Now, you don't really have to worry about PP management during this section of the game because you can easily just use Dragon Claw and then you can even use things like Rock Tomb on the Slugma if you're running low on PP. But here I just kind of hold down the button on Dragon Claw. Eventually things go down and that's going to be the fourth gym down. I think earlier in the video I said the second, third, and fourth gym are all pretty hard. What I meant to say, without going back and editing my voice because I'm a professional, I meant to say the second, third, and fifth gym are all tough. Flannery, probably tough if you're a grass top or something, but not too bad here. And now, since we skipped the Trick Room Rare Candy, we're going to get the Go Goggles after the fight, and it's going to allow me to go into the desert to finally, I don't even know how long we're into this video, but finally we get our first Rare Candy. Andy, and these things are going to start popping up pretty rapid fire, but this one specifically is pretty important. And I do want to point out that this is yet another little quick Abra time skip you can do to get down to Mauville real quick. And this is another part of the game that it kind of takes a little bit of time, not really a ton of time, but we have to do a lot of backtracking. I'm gonna have to go from Mauville all the way down to Slateport, and I'm gonna have to take two boat trips to make it back to Petalburg. There's really no great way to do this. I just kind of base it off the speed run. I just assume that they know exactly what they're doing, doing some testing myself. But this is another thing, just like the little route earlier where you have to make the two big circles. It's just another one of those parts of the game that just takes a little bit of time but I get it it's not really an issue for me but it's something that I would like to you know kind of call out while we're doing our first emerald video and now we're getting ready for the fifth gym and as all the footage is playing out the layout of this gym is that there's left and right rooms you pick your poison like maybe there's a, a speed opponent maybe there's a one hit KO room and you just kind of pick your opponents that way but this is the normal top gym and I love the idea that there's a normal top gym because it's such a strong topping in the first two games so 
I think it's very cool they finally recognized that and got a normal type gem into the game. But there's a subplot here that I need to talk about. Not really that important, but we'll talk about some little things that I find interesting in a minute. But the only reason that you, as a player, moved to this region is because your dad became the gym leader of this town. So we're about to fight your dad. Remember, this is a moment that you've been building up to all game. You've been, you know, growing as a trainer and you're working towards being able to take on your dad, not only take him on, but finally beat him and show him that you're a good trainer. So that's kind of like the subplot that's been building up to this moment. So just keep that in mind. But what's important in terms of gameplay and all that kind of stuff is that at the last final trainer, I'm going to hit level 29 at the very end and I'm going to use that rare candy I got earlier. That's going to let me hit level 30, mostly important for the damage rounding and all that kind of stuff. But we do learn Dragon Dance, not really that important right now, but a great move in general. I'm going to heal up and I'm going to put on that Chesto Berry. And now let's take on our dad, Norman, for the fifth gym. Now there are two ways to approach this fight. You could do it at a lower level, cut out some trainers, and then try to use Dragon Dance along with something like Ancient Power to maybe get rid of slacking as soon as possible. Now the drawback to this strat is that the chip damage that you take along the way, because there's really no guaranteed spots to do four whole setups, which is what you would need. What I ended up doing was getting that extra level, spinning that candy, and then using the damage rounding threshold along with the quiet nature with Dragon Claw to let me just kind of mow things down. You'll see me go for ancient power on the noon just to maybe fish for a boost because the range just isn't there for dragon claw anyway but the idea here is to hope for a turn one yawn from slacking i get it and since i have the chesto berry equipped i can just get rid of the sleep and we can just outpace it now the problem like i said earlier is if you take any chip damage with the dragon dance route slacking and its disgusting stats will absolutely murder you in a single hit with facade and this route just felt a little bit cleaner now we just talked about the father-son moment and all that kind of stuff and how it's like this pivotal character growth type moment and I find it really weird here because your dad's talking to you and he says like one or two things and then out of nowhere Wally's dad just kind of busts in and he's like hey you mind if I steal your son for a minute and he gives you surf which is fine but I just find it kind of like a weird interruption like why would he why would he interrupt this moment somebody let me know but after you pick up surf here there is another rare candy it's hidden right down and then you can use another teleport from Abra to go back to Mauville to do a massive time save. And after that, there is the new Mauville part. You can go in there and you can get Thunderbolt. Now, you will only do this part if you want to use Thunderbolt. Now, Hoenn, infamously, it's known for having too much water, so it goes without saying that a hard-hitting electric move is really great, so we will be getting it today. Now, there's also another rare candy close to the Trick Room house that I'll get as well. That's going to lead us east of Mauville, and I can finally surf, and there's a few things to cover on this route. First is that this is where you're going to get Citrus Berries. There's like four total, but you usually need like two. A Citrus Berry is like an orange berry on crack. It heals 40 HP rather than 10, and it can really swing a fight in your direction if things are going bad, and we'll see that later on. Second is that we're gonna get our second HM user, our final HM user, Entropius. It's the, God, it's gotta be one of the best HM users of all time. Now between this and Meryl, they can learn all eight HMs in the entire game, and I just think that Tropius is a really cool Pokemon that needs some representation, so I wanted to use it. Now also, like with a lot of name pronunciations, I'm usually wrong. I wanna say Tropius so bad, but I have watched a lot of official Pokemon events, so it's Tropius, like you would say tropical. If you didn't know, now you know. There's also the Weather Institute here. Nothing really of note, pretty easy, but I would like to call out my woman crush here. Aqua Admin Shelly, she has the best hair in the series. Look at this glorious red mane here. It's a shame that you really don't see this character more. After that, there's another rival battle. Who cares, it doesn't really matter. The importance here being that you can get fly conveniently right before the next gym will let you use it outside of battle. The first visit to Fortree is just pretty much you passing through, but it is of the utmost importance to enter the Poke Center here for a teleport time skip later. And it's also where I personally like to go ahead and pick up hidden power. There's an old lady in the second house 
she'll give it to you. And just to cover myself, you can also get in power in Slateport if you picked up secret power earlier and next to Fall Arbor. But this just feels more like efficient and along the way to me. Now I haven't talked about my hidden power type. I'll try to find a spot to maybe fit that in. I'm sure we'll talk about it later. But earlier I talked about Cut and the route after Four Tree is where Cut's gonna get it. It's pretty much it's only like two uses in the entire run. And in general, this next little bit, this next few routes will be gathering up a ton of rare candies like this one hidden right here after a couple of trees. After that, this is where you get the Devon scope to see Kecleon. This will give you access to the sixth gym. And the normie route, you would just go back to Four Tree now and you would just go ahead and take on the gym just so that you can have access to fly. But we're, this is another spot where the Abra route really shines. So I'm gonna keep pressing on. A little bit down the route, there's a lake with another rare candy. I'm gonna grab it. And a little bit further, I just keep going east until the game tells me that I've entered Lily Cove, which marks it as a flat path for later. And this is also very important. Now I'm gonna backtrack just a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and do the Mount Pyre section. But first we have one more little quick detour. Now if you continue south of Mount Pyre, you can quickly go to the right, cut a bush. And at the very bottom path, there's another hidden candy. That's the third one on this route alone. And when you look at Mount Pyre, it's a really fast section, especially if you don't need any items further up. You literally just walk into the first room, walk out, fight a few Team Aqua Grunts, and it's over really quickly. I do have to take a second here to talk about the first mandatory double battle in the game. There are three total, and my solution is to not just throw out my weakest HM user, but rather I'm going to use Tropius. Now the reason being is that it's a little bit higher level, it means it's not going to die to every hit, and sometimes when that happens you get into this loop where you're just constantly going into the menu and sending out another HM user. Now another drawback of using low level HM users for double battles is that they'll gain like a ton of levels when you inevitably just go first and one shot the other Pokemon. So that takes up a lot of time too. Using a higher level like Tropius just makes that part a lot faster and I think that's my solution for now. I don't think I'll be making any changes and we'll talk more about double battles. There's a couple more left so we'll talk about them a little bit more but I'm always open minded for any other solutions. But speed is the goal and I think the Tropius approach is the best in my opinion. There's going to be one last rare candy to get in this part of the game and then you're going to do one last last huge Abra teleport skip to get back to Fortree. And now we can start to cruise a little bit more. In the gym, there is another double battle pretty much immediately right after. You can't avoid it. And just like I said, Tropius and its bulk, it just makes it feel a lot better than letting Abra and Meryl just die or watch them gain like five levels and try to learn new moves. It is what it is. And like a lot of things, I want to touch on things like this as much as I can in the first Emerald video before we start glossing over things like this in the future, but that will bring us to Winona. This is the flying type gem, and Winona can be quite scary, and it's because of Swablu, you wouldn't think so. Now I can't tell you guys how many times in practice that I died here, because I was learning the game, I didn't know Swablu had Parasong. Now the catch 22 is that I do need to set up twice, and in the final refined run, I'm not too scared to set up once. Go ahead and take out the Swablu. I'll set up the final time on Ataria, and then we'll go on the sweep. Ancient Power does work here on everything but Skarmory, and Pelipper is also double weak to Electric, so I do swap to Thunderbolt at the end. If you only have Electric moves, something like Altaria can be pretty good against you, and if you're trying to use just like Ice or Rock moves, Skarmory and its Steel Typing can be really good as well. And like I've said a lot, this is the first Emerald video that we're doing, so I do have to gush a little bit about some of the things I like, and Winona's team has several Pokemon that I just personally like a lot. Afterwards, we can use Fly, I can go back to the Jagged Pass, and we can get access to the Team Magma Hideout. Now there's gonna be a lot of team sections coming up, and just like Mount Pyre, or a lot of these other side segments we'll see coming up, they really aren't too bad if you're doing the bare minimum and you know what to do. Now I will talk about the end here, Maxi, because these battles can actually be a nightmare, especially if you rely on physical moves. Intimidate is not something that I'm gonna talk about a lot in this video, because I'm going more of like a special attack focused route, but it's easily one of the best abilities and it can completely neuter some Pokemon in the game. And I think the design overall was smart enough to put Mightyena in the lead a lot. You'll see a lot of Mightyenas in the lead. Now another thing to notice is the levels here. I'm out leveled by each of his Pokemon. And even though I get a pretty good battle here, nothing really goes wrong. I still go down to just red health at the end. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that a lot of these little side content parts aren't really a pushover. Now there is another rare candy in here. It's not really too bad to get 
especially since you can just escape rope out at the very end, but I did cut it out, and that's the end of the Team Magma hideout. It's time to tackle Team Aqua. Now this part is also refreshingly short. You only have four mandatory battles before the boss, and that's gonna lead us to a Matt versus Matt battle. Now it's not as bad as you would think, but you do have to realize that he's he's just a lackey buying time for the real boss to get away in its submarine, so it makes sense that he's a little bit weak. Now things are really gonna start going downhill, and there's not really a ton of game left. Now this is where things get real water heavy, and I'm gonna be heading east to Moss Deep, and this is where the final force double battle takes place. It's the seventh gym with Tate and Liza, and my rules for this one is the same as earlier. I have to deposit all but one of my HM Pokemon, and I'm gonna pick Tropius because it can just last a turn or two. We've already talked about it. I still think it's the right call, but let's just dive into it and see how it plays out. Finally, we can talk about Hidden Power, and Ghost is a premier option in Pokemon Emerald due to this fight. Tropius will go down decently fast, usually a couple of turns, but if you can survive, it can get off a of fly and buy you even more time, but here I just need two Dragon Dances, and that puts me where I want to be. I do have the Citrus Berry just in case things go south and I need to get some health back, but here Tropius just goes above and beyond, he draws the fires like he's supposed to, and then eventually the super effective Ghost type damage just sweeps through the fight. Now I will say, I I thought a lot about the Tropius part of this fight, and if I were to tweak my rule set at all, maybe I would bring a weaker Pokemon to this fight, but it is what it is. First video, gonna be some janky things, but that's a seventh badge down. With only one badge left, there's still a little bit of side content for us to blitz through, and it starts at the Space Center. There's a magma battle coming up. It's a double battle, not a forced win because Steven's your partner, the AI's control in the second part. Just look, you see what it is. I eventually figured this fight out, and it's really not so bad, but in early practice, not knowing the correct order to do things in with what Pokemon would lead to things like Camera Up using a ton of amnesias, and it would start to get really bulky. It would get out of control, but once again, I do think it's pretty cool that I'm actually out leveled at this part in the game, but let's keep it going. Next up is the Seafloor Cavern, and it's sort of like the finale for Team Aqua. Now you know the drill, it's a cave, there's lots of boulder puzzles, but you do eventually pick up Earthquake here. Now the final battle was against Archie after you find Kyogre, and there's no surprise that the game starts off with another intimidating Mighty Inna, but being Team Aqua means that he's really weak to Thunderbolt in the back to make this one pretty easy. So this is where the box art legendary storyline comes to a head and the world is flooding and naturally we really don't care about any of that but here I would like to talk about the single hardest part of the entire game to learn and it's the gauntlet going from seafloor cavern to pacific log the sheer amount of moving trainers makes this a nightmare to do perfectly at high speeds and I promise I'm not being hyperbolic when I say that now there are two sets of trainers here going back and forth towards each other maybe I described that right you can see it on the screen here and this is the only instance ever in any of my speed runs that I've ever done that I've turned off the times three speed to times one temporarily just to do this because it's just too precise for my boomer reaction time to get through it. But this gauntlet is really rough and it probably took me the most practice out of anything to get comfortable with. Pacific Log itself is just for the flat path and since I'm already here, I'm gonna pick up two rare candies real quick. Now the first one isn't really a rare candy. I would like to call this a pseudo rare candy. Now this only applies, this battle right here only applies if you have Thunderbolt because this fish Fisherman here has one Magikarp and a whopping five Gyarados just begging to give you that like a ton of experience. Now if you are a physical Pokemon, don't even bother with this battle because you're going to be intimidated like 22 times and your attack stat is going to make Weedle look strong, but shout out to Austin for suggesting this trainer. He and I worked on a lot of Emerald stuff. Uh, we talked about routing several months ago. We went back and forth talking about this and that. Really helped out a lot, but Thunderbolt can make this one about as quick as it can be. One of the most efficient battles in the entire game given that you have Thunderbolt. There's also just a normal rare candy here, but that's not nearly as exciting. And from there, you can make a beeline to Pseudopolis. You can see the two box art legendaries battle each other, and that means that you need to go find Daddy Rayquaza, and you gotta put a stop to it. And you can see here, I get very nostalgic for this cutscene, and for me personally, this cutscene right here really shows the leap in like graphical fidelity from the Game Boy Color to the Game Boy Advance. This is like really shows it at a high level. And I think most importantly, this moment signifies the end of any side content 
and the path to the end has really opened up for us. First up, I do pick up Brick Break because I will need it in the Elite Four, and I always like to talk about the final gem puzzle. I absolutely love the ice puzzle here, and I wouldn't mind doing having more of this in the game, but that's gonna take us directly into one. Here there's one big thing going on. This is where the second and basically only other time in the game where my lowered speed plays a factor. There's a Kingdra that's gonna come out second and it outspeeds me and I need one Dragon Dance to ensure that that doesn't happen. But I get very unlucky here. And I guess there's really no other way to say that. I set up, Water Pulse gets that minuscule chance to confuse me and when I make it to the Kingdra, obviously I'm gonna hurt myself and I'm gonna take a double super effective Ice Beam and that's gonna take me out for the very first reset of the run. Now the reality what you might be thinking is that you're not going to see that result play out too often but Love Disc also has Lovely Kiss which it uses immediately. 75% chance to confuse you and this I make a little change on the fly here. I know Love Disc can't really threaten me on its own so I just waste a few turns to kind of wait out the confusion with Dragon Dance. Now even if I hurt myself it's much better than eating an Ice Beam and the strategy just pays off. I snap out of confusion. I'm going to outspeed the enemy Dragon Threat and from there Dragon Claw, Thunderbolt, it can just make quick work of the final badge and that's going to set us on the path to the league. With access to Waterfall, there are some quick candies that I can pick up. The first being Left of Fall Arbor, up a Waterfall like you would expect. And then there's going to be a slightly more complex candy to the left of Fortree. Now you also need to use the Acrobat here. You got to jump on some little rails, I guess. And I don't know if you guys ever jumped on fast speed on the Acrobat, but it just doesn't work half the time. It doesn't feel good. Now this is the final candy I'm going to pick up for the run. Like I said earlier, there are 16 total candies that you can get. I guess if you like really needed to or wanted to, but 10 is the number I'm going here for today. So now it's time to talk about Victory Road. Now it's a lot more involved than other games that we've played. You do have to battle Wally where he has a pretty decent team finally, but it's not a problem and I'll just let it play out in the background. But Gen 1 had a lot of trainers in Victory Road and a pretty lengthy section involving a lot of boulder pushing, but there were no trainers that were mandatory. Gen 2 dialed it back a lot with a very, very tiny Victory Road section with zero trainers outside of the final rival battle. But here in Gen 3, outside of Wally, you have four more mandatory battles you have to do. You have to navigate the darkness along with some minor puzzles that include rock smash, strength, surf, and waterfall. But like I said earlier, Flash is just given to you on the mainline path. Maybe in the future I'll learn how to navigate the darkness just to save a little time, but I see no reason to do that now. And there's really nothing else to talk about. When I do make it to the league right before it, I'm just going to pop all of my rare candies. I have nine left. That's going to get me up to level 55. And now my friends, the Elite Four is all all that's left. Sydney is up first, he's a dark top trainer, and another spot in the game where they're gonna pop a intimidate user right up front. But those early candies using those up front before the Elite Four, it makes this and basically most of the other battles here are gonna be about as straightforward as it gets. Now remember in an optimized run, you're gonna find the hardest point in the game and you're gonna work backwards. And with the champion fight at the end having so many ice moves, the side effect of being prepared for that means that I can just spam Dragon Claw and get through this one with zero issues. BB is up next and she's a ghost specialist. I do need plus two to my attack with Dragon Dance and conveniently you're gonna get a free turn up front because Dust Clops will go for protect virtually every time. Not every time, but every first turn, you know what I mean. Now you don't wanna mess around too much because you got Curse, that's gonna be a death sentence and it's worth noting that there are some ice moves lingering around like you'll see here on the second Dust Clops. Now it doesn't do a ton of damage, we're gonna be just fine, but once you get to that plus two, you el eliminate any RNG from statuses. And I guess I'll just mention it here, that Hidden Power Ghost, this is another spot where it shines pretty bright. Now this one did take a little bit of thinking, but overall, not really that bad. Glacia is the Ice Top Specialist, and you might think that this could be a problem, but it's not. Now I've learned Brick Break here, and with Dragon Dance set up, I can easily sweep. Now this is gonna be possible because Celio wants to set up a turn one hail and that's just perfect because airlock will make it do nothing and that just amounts to a free setup and while there are some really hard hitting ice moves left in the fight Celio on the lead doesn't have any of them. Ice Ball is like an ice type rollout, meaning that it's gonna take time to ramp up and it starts out really weak. And what that translates to is that I get to my plus two really easy. And from there, Brick Break can start chiseling down some ice on our path to defeating the third 
third Elite Four member with ease. Drake is the obligatory dragon specialist, and this is probably the easiest main fight in the entire game. Just use Dragon Claw. You naturally outspeed everything, you don't have to set anything up, and the super effective damage can just rip through his team, and that's going to set us up for that champion fight. But before we go in, I am going to equip a Citrus Berry, I'm going to learn Earthquake over Brick Break, and let's just take a look at the final battle. This fight is very difficult because we are not at a high level and Wallace is going to bring out back to back to back Pokemon that all have really strong ice moves that will obliterate us. Now at level 58 with a quiet nature we can get through this one really easy. I can one shot the Wellord with a Thunderbolt with a 100% guarantee and when it comes to Tentacruel with Earthquake on the set I can also one shot it guaranteed. Next Melodic's going to come out and I'm going to freeze frame here because I need to talk about something with this fight. You have a choice in how you want to approach this fight. You can get a Pecha Berry very early in the game and you can save it for this fight because if you can make it to this situation and you're at full health, you never know what the AI is going to do. It can either go for Toxic, you can heal it with the Pecha Berry and take out the Melodic in two hits, or the computer will go for the super effective Ice Beam, do a ton of damage, and you can heal with the Citrus Berry. It's pretty much a 50-50 coin flip. You never know what you're going to get. And as we unpause here, you're going to see that I get the Toxic. And even though I have a really great matchup pretty much for the rest of the fight, the way things work in Gen 3 is that Toxic will always tick. In Gen 1, for example, if I had Toxic on me but I one-shot a Pokemon, Toxic would never tick, but it's going to tick every turn here and it's going to start to add up. And what really puts the final nail in the coffin for this attempt is that Ludicolo uses Double Team and I'm going to miss an attack. And that means that Toxic is just going to be ticking too hard by this point. And even though we get pretty close here, Whiskash can smell blood in the water and it goes for a Surf to finish me off for the second reset of the run. Not too bad. Hopping back into the next attempt, we've already seen that the first two Pokemon go down to one hit, so it really doesn't matter. Not really worth it to keep looking at them, but it all comes down to what do you want Melodic to do? And in this scenario, I want Ice Beam. Here, we're going to see it, and here's how it plays out. It does monstrous damage, taking us nearly into the red health. We're still in yellow health, but we're losing a lot. That means the Citrus Berry is going to kick in. And I think earlier I said Citrus Berry recovers 40. I meant 30. It recovers 30. Maybe somebody didn't go ahead and comment that down below, but this is exactly the position I want to be in because now I can take down the melodic and I'm healthy I'm just healthy enough to dissuade the computer from going for straight damage even if it's resisted and just to make things even better I do not miss the ludicolo this time when it uses double team and all Wallace has left in the back is a whisk cash it doesn't know what to do and after it uses an amnesia I finish it off with an earthquake to finish the run Rayquaza finishes the game with a final in-game time of 3 hours, 2 minutes, and 55 seconds. Now, I'm not going to name any names here, but there was a time last year where I was messaging somebody and I was like, hey, I want to learn Emerald and I want to do all this stuff. I think it's going to be faster than Crystal because if you look at the world record times, it's much faster. And somebody said, they laughed at me and they said, there's no way Emerald's faster than Crystal. And it is. It's like 30 minutes faster on my very first run. Now, keep in mind that Rayquaza is not a perfect Pokemon. There's lots of parts where it struggles at, and there's going to be Pokemon that are even better than this. I wouldn't be surprised if I kept chipping away, finding different Pokemon. I wouldn't be surprised if like two hours and 45 minutes was a possibility, but this is a really good result. Now, let me just address something real quick that you might be wondering before we sign out in the video. Obviously, this is the very first run. I do have the split data recorded, but I have nothing to compare it to, so we'll see that for Emerald runs later, and hopefully I can just trim out so much of the fat because first run, I had a lot to talk about, so here we go. Also, you might be saying, hey Matt, why aren't you doing Steven Stone at the end? And I have a very, very simple answer for you. The speed run does not do Steven Stone. Steven Stone is not part of the official speed run. Whereas maybe in Generation 2, Red is a part of the speed run, a very crucial component to the game. Steven Stone is just like sloppy side content. He's like a glorified gym leader. If you have things that are good against steel types, he's going to be easy. If you don't, whatever. I don't view Steven Stone as the end of Emerald. The speed run agrees with that and I base all my stuff off the speed run so that's the reasoning for that but I really don't have much more for you guys if you made it this far you're a real one subscribe do all that stuff greatly appreciate it that's all I got for you I'm gonna stop talking bye